Good morning and welcome to First Southern. We are so glad that you're here with us and we would love the opportunity to connect with you this morning. So what we would ask you to do right now is go over to the uh, chat or comment section of the platform you're on. Uh, drop us a hello, say hi to us. Uh, we've got pastors waiting to interact and to discuss and answer questions that you might have. Uh, so swing on over there right now and do that. Also, if you're new to First Southern, we would love to connect with you. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind dropping dropping us a direct message or uh, sending us an email, you can also go over to our website, uh, fsbcs.org. Uh, we have a contact page. Either way, we would love the opportunity to reach out to you, uh, answer questions you might have, and get you connected, uh, if you would like to, to our church and the ministries we have here. Uh, so drop us a line, drop us a direct message, say hello to us in the chat and comment section, uh, and we would love to connect with you there. Uh, lastly, I do want to say we will be giving an important announcement about the reopening of our campus uh, right at the end uh, during the announcements this morning. So please stick around for the announcement time uh, after the message so that you can get that important message. Uh, we hope that today's message and worship time and prayer time will further you in your journey with Jesus. Good morning, First Southern. I'm so very excited that in just one week, we'll be worshiping together. But until then, join us in your living room as we worship and sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for Oh, 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 oh,
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still And all alone Oh, praise the name of the Lord Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we give you the praise this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love to us, for your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for your son who you willingly and lovingly sent to this earth to teach us about your kingdom, to die on a cross, to save us from our sins, and who rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. And we thank you for the victory that he has gained for all his followers over death and sin. So Lord, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, we pray that your will would be done. Do your will in us as individuals and in our church, in our community, in our state, and in our nation. Lord, we want your will to be done on earth the same way your will is done in heaven. So Lord, use us to be part of your will, uh, ultimately to lead every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. We pray that. 
Lord, we also thank you for all of the ways you've provided for us. We thank you and we pray that you would continue to provide for our needs and that you would also help us to be good stewards of all of the resources and the blessings that you have provided to us. So thank you for those blessings. Thank you for those resources and help us to use them in the way that most glorifies you. Lord, we also this morning recognize that we are sinners. Lord, we have disobeyed you. We have fallen short of your perfect will. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would forgive us of those sins. Lord, help us to always recognize the temptations that we have in our life and help us to turn away from those temptations, that we would pursue the escape plan that you always provide that we would not be ensnared by our sin, but we would run away. We would repent of that sin. Help us also, Lord, in the uh, light of the abundant forgiveness that you've given us, we pray that you would help us to forgive others. So help us to be a forgiving people. Help us to live rightly in your will. Help us to follow you in all that we do. And Lord, we lift up Uh, our city, our state, our nation, and this world today. We pray for our leaders, leaders at every level, in our churches, in in our communities, in our state, our nation, and around the world. We pray that you would give leaders wisdom in in with all the difficult decisions that they have to make today we pray that you would guide them in those decisions help them to understand what you are calling them to do so lord we pray for our leaders we pray that you would help them lord we pray for our churches we pray for first southern and all the churches around the world we pray that you would use our churches use your church body to lead every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. Lord, make disciples of you through the work of your church. Use each and every one of us to love you and love our neighbor as ourself. So Lord, help us to have a heart for the lost. And we pray that those, those people in our lives who don't know you, we pray that you would help us to be a light in their world of darkness, that we could be the hands and feet of Jesus that they see you in the lives that we live. So help us to show people your salvation, your rescue from the sin that we are all guilty of. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we lift all of this in the name of our amazing, powerful, loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn now to Matthew chapter 7. Now, if you're not familiar with where the book of Matthew is located in the Bible, uh, what I'd like you to do is take your Bible or your app or whatever you're reading on and and turn to the table of contents or the list of books uh, that are in the app. Matthew is located in the second main section of the Bible called the New Testament. Matthew's actually the first book of the New Testament, uh, and so you can find it there. If you're in an app, uh, Matthew's probably uh, about a a third of the way down the list of books uh, uh, throughout the Bible. So you're looking for the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Now, as you're turning there, uh, I have always been involved in carpentry. I grew up in a household where my dad uh, was a carpenter. That was his business. Uh, he repaired roofs and, and homes and, and did odd jobs in houses. Uh, he later kind of shifted his business around to mainly doing house painting. But I was always around carpentry, working with wood and, and building things. Uh, at one time during college or right after college, I actually worked for a long time in a wo- uh, wood shop uh, where we built cabinetry and, uh, and different uh, items made of wood. And there was one thing in that job that drove me nuts. There's one thing that, that every time I would come home, this one aspect of that job just grinded me. Uh, it was not that I would come home with my hands stained from the paint and the stain that I used on the wood. It was not that I would come home with splinters and cuts on my hands. It wasn't even that after working a full day in a hot shop that I would come home smelling like a dead skunk that had been rolled in rotten eggs. That the, Those things were okay. Those were easy to get through. The thing that absolutely drove me nuts is when I would come home with sawdust in my my eyes. Have you ever gotten something in your eye like dirt or, or gravel or sawdust or something like that? 
there is not there are not many things that I've experienced that are as annoying uh, as having something in my eye. I, I don't know why that is for me, but I just it drives me crazy. And interesting enough, some of you know where I'm going. Interestingly enough, Jesus addresses that very thing uh, in today's passage. So take your Bibles or your apps and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 7. So chapter 7 of Matthew, starting in verse 1, it says this. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will also be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Interesting passage today. Uh, It's kind of an over-the-top illustration. So let me kind of just uh, put this in perspective for a moment. The words that are Jesus is using here in the Greek language. Now, Matthew, the book that we're reading out of today, was originally written in Greek. And so many times I'll come back to what the original meaning of the Greek word that is used uh, would be. Now, the original word in the Greek for speck, uh, that we find in, in verses uh, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, the word speck there actually refers to a small piece of wood. Uh, it doesn't refer to like sawdust or, or a tiny little grain generally. It usually referred to a splinter of wood or a little piece of wood. It could even refer to like a stalk from a piece of wheat or or long grass. Uh, and so the illustration here is that This little piece, while small in my hand, would be huge if I was to stick this in my eye. But Jesus takes that illustration a step further and says, we're hypocrites by pointing out that speck when in reality we have a log in our eye. Now the Greek word for log in this passage can refer to a log like what I'm holding, or it could refer to a wooden beam like what we would think of today as a, as a two by four. But one way or the other, it means a large piece of wood. Now, this illustration's pretty over the top because can you imagine me not being aware that I have a log in my eye? Jesus is intentional with the the huge dramatic flare of this passage, of this illustration. He's being very intentionally here. He wants to be over the top for a very specific reason. And that reason is this. Jesus is trying to show us how completely ridiculous it is when we judge others. And so here's my big idea. If you've watched many of my messages, you know most of the time I, I give one, a one sentence, almost like a summary of the main point of my message. And today's big idea is this. Be a log remover, not a speck inspector. Let me say that again. Be a log remover, not a speck inspector. We need to understand that that God has, Jesus has a plan for the way we evaluate ourselves and evaluate the people around us. A spec inspector is concerned about others when they haven't actually examined their own heart and their own sin, where a log remover is more concerned about carefully examining themselves and is less concerned about the people around them. Uh, what do you tend toward? Do you tend to be a log remover or a spec inspector? But, but there's so much more to this. Let, let's deep, deep dive a little deeper into this idea because this is not the only passage in the Bible that addresses judging. Uh, 
Uh, so if you were to go into Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, or you were to go into 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6, you would read extensively about Jesus' teaching, uh, first off through him in Matthew 18, and through Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 and, and 6, you would read extensively about what we are called to do when it comes to uh, judging, judging others. And so I want to tie all these passages in together because they're all interrelated. First off, Matthew 18 verses 15 through 20 speaks about when we have a brother in sin uh, or, or a brother who is outside of God's will and God's plan for their lives, that we're supposed to go to that brother or sister uh, privately and offer help to get out of that sin, to repent, to turn away, uh, you know, to, to say, I see the sin and I'm going this way. Uh, we're supposed to go to them privately, offer help, and if they refuse, they say, get out of my face, I love my sin, I want to do this, leave me alone. If they say that, then it says, then take two or three witnesses with you um, and talk to them again, offering help, helping them with redemption and, and turning away from that sin. If they continue to resist, and again, this is about a brother or sister in Christ. This is not about someone who does not know Jesus. I'm talking specifically, Matthew 18 is talking specifically about your interaction with other followers of Jesus. It says, if they've rejected you those two times, then at that point, take that issue, that, that knowledge of this person's sin, you're supposed to go and take it to the church and let the church deal with that particular sin issue. And now it's not talking about when it says go to the church, it's not talking about going to the person who sits next to you at church on a Sunday morning when we're gathered together. It's talking about going to church leadership and letting the wisdom of the leaders of the church figure out how to deal with that sin that has been made aware, made, brought out. So that's what Matthew 18 verses 15 through 20 says. Then if you fast forward in the New Testament to 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6, you're going to read a, a passage that Paul writes to the Corinthian church where he's pretty much condemning them for accepting, for uh, condoning sin within their church. Uh, and he goes on to talk about how if you've got someone in sin and they're not willing to step away from the sin, then, then you're supposed to take certain actions with that person. You're, but again, it's talking about a brother or sister in Christ, someone who knows Jesus or is a member or a person of that church. If that person is in sin, then you're supposed to allow the leadership of the church to work that out with that person, to help that person get out of that sin. Guys, that's what we're talking about when we talk about judging. When we use the word judge someone, uh, or the phrase judge someone, that's talking about pointing out sin. But notice, both times in Matthew 18 and in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, the passage is very clear that the leadership of the church is supposed to be the one helping and working in that judging situation. You see, the Bible calls us with our fellow followers of Jesus to not be judgy one-on-one -on -one with people, but rather corporately as a body to go and help someone out of their sin. Judgment has a purpose. Judging someone has a, a, a purpose in pulling them away from their sin and bringing them back into uh, the plan and the path that God has for their life. And so judging does have a place. So let's, let's do away with all the cultural myths and the, the things that people say so often about judging. Don't judge me. Only God can judge me. That's not what the Bible says. But the Bible is very clear that we as individuals should submit our judging uh, or our desire to go pick that speck or that log out of someone's eye, that's for the leadership of the church to take care of. But it also goes a step further. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about, listen, you're supposed to take certain steps with someone who's unwilling to step away from their sin. And then Paul makes this little statement. It's almost like a side statement. He says, but I'm not talking about those who are not followers of Jesus. Because if I was talking about them, you'd have to do this and this and this. 
We're not called to judge those who don't follow the Lord. We're not called to judge unbelievers because it's someone who doesn't know Christ, doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They don't live by the same standards that we live by. We know what sin is because we live by this book, because we live by the wisdom and the plan and the instruction and the love that God has given us through his word. But an unbeliever does not believe this. An unbeliever does not live by the standards laid out in God's word. And so our judgment has no place with unbelievers. Now, uh, we can go into talking about culture and society uh, and governments and all those things. That's a totally different story. We'll get to that in a different message. Uh, But when it comes to us interacting with individuals, let me sum up with fellow followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to go to them them and ask if we can help them, offer resources and help and accountability to help them get out of their sin and start pursuing God again. And if they refuse, then we take it to the wisdom of the church, the church leadership. That's what we do with brothers and sisters in Christ. But if they're a non-believer, if they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we're not called to go and judge them. We're called to love on them and feed into them and pray for them and speak the gospel truth into their lives, to be light in their world of darkness and to be salt in their decaying world. And so our interaction, when it comes to judging, our interaction with followers of Jesus versus unbelievers are totally different things. When we're interacting with those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we're called to love them with the love that Jesus has for all of us. So, kind of a side thing on that. So, um, how can you lead, how can God lead you to become someone who can remove the log out of your own eye? I think that's the big question today. How do we get out of this? It's a weird idea. Uh, I mean, just putting it up to my face, I can't imagine what you're viewing right now. But how can we get rid of this? How can we remove the log? Well, first off, I would say that you need to have awareness. You see, we all need to be aware of our temptations. We need to be aware of the sins that we're particularly susceptible to. We need to be aware of our shortfallings. And we need to be aware of those and admit them. We need to admit that we are not perfect. Romans 3.23 says that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we first off need to admit, recognize that we are not perfect. But it's not enough to just be aware that we have shortfallings or temptations or sins. We also need to take steps to remove those short fallings, temptations, or sins. And that's where the next step comes in. So I said, how can you uh, be someone who can remove the log from your eye? Well, first off, you can't do it. Jesus has to do it for you. The first step in doing that and allowing Jesus uh, to be able to do that in your life is be aware. The second thing is that we have to be living a life of confession. We need to be willing to take the log out by talking to Jesus regularly, going to God in prayer and telling him, this is what I'm struggling with. This is my sin. This is my temptation. This is my shortfalling. Help me. That's what we talked about in the Lord's Prayer in last week's message. Um, We also need to be willing to go to someone that we trust in our lives to say, hey, privately, can you help me? I I struggle with this particular issue or shortfall or temptation or sin. Can you help me to avoid that or to get out of that? Can you walk with me through this process so that I can live a closer relationship with my Savior? Uh, And so we need to be aware and we need to be confessional. We need to tell God and tell others what it is that we struggle with so that Jesus can help walk us out and give us victory and others can help us in gaining that victory. Now, 
That's what the, the spec versus the log is talking about in this passage. But I want to spend some time talking about verse 6. So take your Bibles or your apps and read with me again that last verse that we read. Chapter 7, verse 6 says this. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, what's going on here? This is such a random statement in the middle of this teaching that Jesus gives us. But if you were to take a closer look at the entire Sermon on the Mount, so Matthew chapter 5 through 7, if you were to read all three of those chapters, you might notice that Jesus quite often through the Sermon on the Mount will give a block of teaching and then will conclude or end that block with a one statement summary or an illustration of some kind that wraps up that block of teaching that he had just taught on. And verse six is actually doing that. You see, verse six is related to verses one through five. So let's recap for just a second. Let's look at the big picture for a moment. Jesus has just taught that we're not to judge others, that we're not called to be spec inspectors, but we're called to be log removers, removing the log from our own eye. In other words, we need to be more concerned about us and our sin and gaining victory over our sins and temptation than we should be concerned with others. That's the primary teaching in verses one through five. And then he goes into, don't give dogs what is holy, don't throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. That statement in verse six is a summation, a summary of verses one through five. He's wrapping up this block of teaching that he's given us in verses one through five. And here's what he's telling us. He's telling us that when we judge others, we, from a spiritual viewpoint, we begin to look at them in our judgment. We see them lower than ourselves. We see them like dogs or pigs. Now, just FYI, we're not talking about dogs like the cute little pets that we have at home. We're talking about back in that day and time, dogs roamed the streets and they carried disease and they were, uh, you know, they were gross. They, They weren't something that people thought good of or highly of. And so, What this is teaching us is that when we look down on others, when we judge others, when we don't see people through the eyes of humility that Jesus calls us to, when we judge them, we see them as less than us. We see them as pigs. We see them as dogs. And that pearl, that valuable, precious thing that it warns not to throw to the pigs and the dogs is the gospel of Jesus. There is nothing more precious on the the planet in the entire universe than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing uh, on the face of the planet or in all of the universe that brings men rescue, men and women rescue from the consequences of their sins. And when we take that gospel and we try to give it to someone that we have already prejudged or looked down on or had pride over, they will see that pride in us. They will see that we look down on them. They will see that we think less of them. And who wants to receive something from a person that's looking down on you? That, that's not the call of Christ. You see, you and I, are sinners in need of a savior. And before we began following Jesus, we were condemned in our sin. Our sin, our breaking of God's plan and the, the, the guidance and the laws that he gave us, our sin, that breaking of those things has a consequence. You see, when we break God's law, we become criminals in the eyes of our savior. And honestly, when we're a criminal, we deserve punishment. And our, dis- our punishment is eternal death. But Jesus came along and through his sacrifice, through the giving of his blood, the shedding of his blood, he forgave our sins. He took that consequence, that punishment that we all deserve. He took that punishment and he took it on himself. He paid the punishment, the price that we were supposed to pay. And when he paid that, we became rescued from our sin and the consequences of our sin. 
And hear me right now. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus wants to rescue you from your sin. You see, he didn't just die and remain in a grave. He died on a cross, and when his blood was shed, that blood was a sacrifice that cleansed us, that forgave us of our sins. But on the third day after that death, he rose from the grave in victory over sin and death, and he ascended into heaven. Right now, he sits on a throne next to God the Father, and he wants to forgive you of your sins. And if you've got questions about that, what I want you to do right now is I want you to send me a direct message. Um, Send us a direct message or send me an email. My personal email address is chad at fsbcs.org. Chad at fsbcs.org. I want you to stop what you're doing right now and I want you to send me a direct message or send me an email right now and I want to talk to you at this very moment. I want to have a discussion and answer any questions that you might have about what a life-changing relationship with Jesus looks like. So right now, Stop what you're doing. You can ignore the rest of the message. I want you to right now reach out, send me a direct message or an email, and let me explain this in a little more depth. You can know where you will go when you die. You can be forgiven. You can receive eternal, perfect existence in relationship with God. You can go to a place of perfection. And if you've got questions or you want to take that next step in your journey with Jesus, stop what you're doing and contact me right now, chad at fsbcs.org. So that gospel, the gospel is that message of the sacrifice, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, that hope that we have that we can be forgiven. That's the gospel message. And when we look down on others, when we see other people as pigs and dogs, then they're not gonna want what we offer because the way we see them, the way we treat them, they are going to take that precious gospel message and they're gonna trample it and they're gonna attack us. You see, this passage is about how we look at other people. This passage is about humility and understanding that you and I are no better than any other person. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what their skin color is. I don't care if they smell bad, if they haven't showered in ages. I don't care if they have as much money as you have or or whatever. There's so many things that we judge people for. And it doesn't matter what that person looks like or smells like. None of that matters. Every person is just as worthy or just as unworthy Uh, of the salvation, the rescue of Jesus, as you and I are. We are just as unworthy. We are just as bad as sinners. We We are just as condemned. And so we have no right to look at people as lower than we are. We have no right to look at people as less than we are. And so who is it that you struggle to see through the eyes of Jesus, through the compassion and the love that Jesus sees us through. Who do you struggle to see through those eyes, through that lens? Who do you struggle to not judge? So the question is, are you a speck inspector or are you a log remover? Especially in this time of COVID and this time of protest, it's so easy for us to judge somebody and what they're doing when we have no idea their situation. We have no idea what their circumstances are. We have no idea where their heart and their intentions are at. And it's so easy for us to cast judgment on them when in reality, it's not our place to do that. Our place is to love others the way Jesus loves us. Even when we were sinners, even when we were enemies of Jesus, he loved us and gave his life for us. And we should be looking at others that way. And so in this time when uh, hostility and conflict is the norm, in this a time when opinions are varied and they are everywhere, our difference in opinions should never make us look down on another person. Our difference in opinions, followers of Jesus, should never negate our unity 
in Jesus. Our unity is more value, valuable than any of our opinions. Uh, our unity in Jesus is more valuable than our uh, beliefs about different events that are going on in our lives. Our unity in Jesus is more important than all of that. And so today, we should call ourselves to always treat one another the way Jesus treats us, with love, with respect, with mercy and grace and with kindness. So take a moment. Remember, I said you need to be aware and you need to confess. In order to get that log out of your eye, we all need to be aware of what our sins are and how we look at people, how we judge people. And then we need to be confessional. We need to go to the Lord and we need to pray for forgiveness and we need to ask for his help to get away from that sin and maybe probably we need to go to someone and say, I need your help getting out of this. Will you help me? Will you hold me accountable? Put yourself in the shoes of the person that you disagree with maybe and see them through love rather than through judgment. I think this passage teaches us rather than judging someone and looking down on someone, we need to spend more time just focusing on loving others. So where do you struggle to love others, especially those who disagree with you? Where do you struggle to show and extend love and kindness? Guys, it's okay to disagree, but that disagreement should never divide us, especially as followers of Jesus in the body of Christ. So we're called to put our judgment aside and to love and respect and show kindness to one another. Will you do that this week? Will you choose to love rather than to judge? Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, thank you so much. God, we thank you for your son. We thank you that he was so willing to come and pay such a, a hefty price so that he could love us and forgive us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to see others through the eyes that you see us, that you would help us to see others through the eyes that you see them, that you would help us to have compassion and empathy and love towards those who are different than we are and those who are like us. Lord, those we disagree with, those that we've had hostile uh, interactions with in the past, we pray that you would help us to love them. That no matter what we do, we would choose love rather than division. That we would choose unity rather than hostility. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for what you've done for us. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for joining us here at First Southern this morning. We are so glad that you were here with us. And let me give you a quick update on some things that are going on with our church and in our community. Uh, first off, our Vacation Bible School, aka VBS, is on our website and is ready to go. So parents, grandparents, what we would ask you to do is go to our website, fsbcs.org, and click on the Events tab. There under our events tab, uh, you'll find information and instructions about our VBS, and you'll also see where to register so that you can uh, have your kids or your grandkids or whoever, the neighborhood kids, uh, come and participate in our VBS this year. Uh, so go to our website, get connected to our VBS this year. Um, we are continuing with our Serve Scottsdale initiative. Uh, I hope that you know about what this is. We're uh, collecting money and food uh, for our local food bank, for elderly uh, individuals in our community that are vulnerable. Uh, we do, we've got a ministry, or we're supporting a ministry that goes and does wellness checks on them and brings them food and checks on them. Uh, we're also supporting a homeless ministry through our church that we go out monthly and, and support our homeless community by feeding them and providing for some of their needs. And we're also helping 
helping out churches in our state who are financially struggling uh, through this difficult time. And so if you would like to partner with us for the Serve Scottsdale Initiative, what I would ask you to do is uh, send a check or go to our giving page on our website and give a donation to Serve Scottsdale. So if you send us a check, just make sure on the memo line that you put Serve Scottsdale, and we will make sure that every penny of your donation goes towards these ministries, the food bank and uh, helping elderly couples, homeless and, and churches that are financially struggling. Every penny goes into helping those different uh, individuals or groups. And so please partner with us and let's make a difference here in Scottsdale uh, during this difficult time. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus helping those who are less fortunate than us. So please uh, consider giving toward this very worthy cause. Lastly, let me give you an announcement regarding uh, the reopening of our campus and the, the startup of uh, our in-person services. Um, we're hoping that next Sunday, June 21st, uh, that we will be gathering as a church in person. Um, but I, I do want you to also be aware that the leadership team of our church uh, is actively uh, looking at the data that is out there. They are uh, paying attention to what's going on uh, within our state. Um, and if you've paid attention, uh, you may be aware that uh, our COVID-19 numbers have been uh, spiking. They've been going up uh, quite a bit. And our hospitals uh, have announced that they are in a pretty dire situation, that they, uh, most of our hospitals are at or are uh, close to full capacity. Um, and so because of many other uh, aspects of this whole thing that are going on, the leadership team is watching that. They are uh, paying attention to the information that we have available. Uh, they are go we have been going to the Lord in prayer, and we have been seeking His counsel and His direction in our life. And we will be uh, letting you know what the decision is uh, on reopening on the 21st, on next Sunday. Uh, you'll know very soon one way or the other. And so uh, please keep an eye on your emails uh, and on social media and on the website. If you're not getting the emails, send us an email at info at fsbcs.org and we will add you to our uh, email list. If you don't do email, please connect with someone who does do email or call us here at the church and we will make sure to personally reach out to you and let you know what the latest updates are with our reopening. But if we do reopen, and let me not say if, if and when we reopen, because uh, we are excited with the, the possibility of reopening, we encourage you, uh, if, you're, uh, if you are susceptible to COVID-19, uh, if you are vulnerable, if you're over the age of 65, or if you're simply not comfortable coming back quite yet, please stay at home. We are going to continue to offer our online services, both classic and modern at 9.30 and 11. Nothing is gonna change with our online presence. So if you're not comfortable, if you're vulnerable, uh, if you uh, are sick or anything like that, please be blessed in staying home. You have not just permission, but we ha you have our encouragement to stay home and be blessed through our online interaction. So many of you will be coming back though, and things are going to look very different. Uh, there, Attitudes are going to be different. Some are very passionate right now uh, about social distancing and following the CDC guidelines. Uh, and some of you are not passionate about that. And that's okay. We understand that there's a difference. But also our campus and the way we do services uh, are going to be different. So let me uh, give you some examples. We will be following uh, CDC guidelines for distancing. So for example, uh, we're going to recommend that people stay six feet apart. We're not going to encourage shaking hands or even bumping elbows. We would encourage you to wave uh, from six feet away and, and keep that distance so that you can stay as safe as possible. We're going to be recommending uh, everyone wear a mask. As a matter of fact, all of our staff and all of our volunteers who are serving on uh, our in-person services uh, will be wearing masks unless they're on stage performing. And so we will be wearing masks and we encourage you to do the same. Uh, we're not going to be having any groups, uh, no small groups, no Sunday school groups, uh, no children no students right now. Uh, we simply don't uh, have the space right now to follow social distancing in the classrooms that we have uh, for our groups. 
Uh, during the service, there's not going to be a welcome time. Uh, there's not going to be a time where we, we pass the offering plate. Instead, there will be an offering box uh, located just outside uh, the front doors of the worship center and fellowship hall, as well as the already uh, mounted uh, donation boxes that have been on our walls for some time. So things are going to be different. And we're going to recommend that everybody follow the CDC guidelines if and when you come uh, to our uh, in-person services. Now, we understand that there are many theories and there are many opinions out there about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but we would ask for the short time that you're here on our campus. We would simply ask that you would value your love for your neighbor and you would value your love for your brother and sisters in Christ who are concerned and are following the CDC guidelines, that your love for them would be more valuable than your opinions for the, the short amount of time you're here on campus, and that you would put your opinions aside for just this time, and you would love your neighbors by honoring them and following those guidelines with us so that we can protect and we can love us together as a church, that we can live in unity. You see, our love for our neighbor and our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ always trumps our opinions. It always does. And so out of your love, we pray that you would uh, follow these guidelines and that you would be kind and that you would be gracious and that you would be patient with everyone, leaders, attenders, volunteers, everyone who's here. Because that's who we are. That's what we exist to do is to love God and to love others. So those are the announcements. Again, we will keep you updated this week. So pay attention to your emails and social media and our website. Um, lastly, stay connected. Um, no matter how this plays out, our small groups are gonna continue to meet online only. And so if you're not connected to an online uh, small group, please, we encourage you, get connected to one. Uh, if you want some information or you would like some help getting connected uh, to one of our online groups, simply send us an email or call us here at the church Monday through Thursday, uh, and we would love to connect you. We would love the opportunity to get you connected to an online group. So stay connected, stay safe, and remain in your faith. God bless and have a wonderful week.